Welcome to Education Beat. I'm Ann Vasquez, Executive Director of EdSource. California recently approved the first round of grants to convert potentially thousands of schools into full-service community schools. The $3 billion program is the nation's most ambitious effort to create schools serving multiple health and learning needs of children. Community schools offer wraparound services to help meet children's basic needs in order for them to thrive emotionally and academically. We know that when families are really struggling with X, Y, Z, it really impacts a child's learning. And so that's also part of the community school strategy, this whole child approach. What do community schools look like? And how do they help? Here is this week's Education Beat with host Zadie Stabley. When you walk into Dr. Martin Luther King Academic Middle School in San Francisco, one thing you might notice is there are a lot of adults. At our school, we have over 50 partnerships with community-based organizations. Leslie Hu is the community school coordinator at Martin Luther King. We have a partner who is co-teaching health education inside our science class. We have artists and residents coming in and doing arts integration into math and into um, social studies classes and English. We have a lot of people that come in and possibly do mental health services, for example, like a case manager who will help goal set with kids and help them get to sort of where they need to go. It all started about eight years ago when a man named Michael Essien became the principal. He had previously been a teacher across the Bay in Oakland. Oakland is a pioneer in the community schools movement, and it has one of the largest concentrations of community schools in the nation. And Michael Essien was inspired by that model. It was really an inspiration. He saw how it could be really impactful to actually have, like, Like basically Kaiser have a health clinic. I mean, he talks to me about how La Raza had a health clinic at that school site. Let's take a step back and talk about what a community school is. The notion of a school as a community space is not new. I grew up in rural Mendocino County, and I remember teenagers and adults using the school blacktop to play basketball on the weekends and a local theater company using the cafeteria for rehearsals in the evening. But a full service community school goes beyond that. The idea is that students arrive on campus with a lot of needs that you might not think of as related to academics, but which can get in the way of learning, like a health problem or worry about where their family is going to sleep that night or anxiety caused by trauma that causes them to act out. So community schools provide all kinds of other services for kids and their families, health care, mental health therapy, housing assistance, fresh fruit and vegetables, Having those services at school makes it easier for families to access, and it works. Research has found that community schools, when they're run well, lead to better attendance, fewer discipline problems, improved school cultures, and better communication with families. A fundamental part of being a community school is looking at the specific needs in your community, not just copying other schools, but seeing what your community actually needs. So for example, dental health. It turned out in the neighborhood next door to Martin Luther King Middle School, there weren't very many dentists in the entire zip code. And so we knew a lot of our kids are from there. That means that they have to take the bus or drive across town to be able to find a dentist, you know. Um, and so that was a really big deal. We, when we did surveys with our young people and we talked to our young people, like when was the last time you went to the dentist? A lot of kids couldn't even remember. A lot of kids like in seventh grade, for example, said, I haven't been a dentist since I've gotten to middle school, you know. So the school partnered with the University of the Pacific to put a dental clinic on campus. They've also done a lot inside the classroom with community partners. Math teachers and after-school staff work together to do an after-school acceleration class to improve math skills. Next year, the school plans to partner with a medical clinic, Silver Avenue Family Health Center. A lot of our students who want to play sports have to get a physical, right? Well, if your parent is working four jobs, you maybe you don't have health insurance, whatever that might be, it's really hard to get that health physical to be able to play baseball or basketball or or, or run track, right? Well, we are going to work really hard to have a health clinic come to our school to provide these physicals for our student athletes so they can participate in sports. But we have schools in San Francisco who could not even pull together a sports team because their students could not get to the doctors to get a physical. These are the kind of problems that community schools have to work towards 
actually solving. So our young people can access the sports that could be like the game changer for them, right? And so how do we actually solve those problems? And so we were intentionally sought the clinic down the street so that we can actually have a doctor be able to provide those physicals for our young people in order to access sports. This is Education Beat, getting to the heart of California schools. I'm Zadie Stavely. This week, schools made for and by the community. My colleagues John Fensterwald and Ali Tadion have been covering the new effort in California to expand community schools. I asked Ali to come talk with me about the first round of grants. Hi, Ali. Hi, Zadie. So tell me about this big news about community schools grants for schools all over California. Yeah, well, this month, the State Board of Education approved $635 million in planning and implementation grants for 265 school districts, county offices of education, and charter schools in low-income areas to transition to full-service community schools. So of the 265 recipients, 192 are receiving planning grants to begin the process. And then uh, the other 73 are, are, have already been planning it and uh, they are getting five-year implementation grants. And that covers 444 schools and the amounts range from about 700,000 to 2.4 million. Oakland Unified will be the biggest recipient, with $66 million to expand and supplement its community school network. Los Angeles Unified and San Francisco Unified are also big recipients, and some small rural districts like Wheatland Union High School District near Yuba City and Sanger Unified in Fresno County will receive planning or implementation grants to start up community schools for the first time. A lot of districts didn't apply this round, though. Maybe that's because this year has been so crazy with staff shortages, student absences, and COVID challenges. More than two-thirds of the planning and implementation funding has yet to be spent. Allie visited a community school in West Contra Costa Unified. So you visited Helms Middle School in San Pablo in West Contra Costa Unified. What did, what did you see there? Well, when I went to the Helms campus, students were in class at the time, but outside of the campus, there was a Contra Costa County Health Services mobile dental clinic. Uh, It was an RV parked out front. And the principal and community schools director took me to one of the classrooms where they do a lot of the community schools work, um, where a lot of the services are offered. And there were free books available, backpacks, supplies, brochures, stuff like that. And there was also... Some classrooms where social workers and uh, psychologists were were housed. So what kind of services, you know, we're talking about wraparound services. What kind of services are offered? Like what's kind of the variety of services? It's a little bit of everything. I mean, one of the big ones is health screenings, you know, like the dental clinic that was outside of Helms. Um, But they also offer counseling, counseling. you know, housing assistance sometimes, uh, assistance with food help, uh, family support, stuff like that. Community schools really act as like a liaison between available services, uh, maybe through the county or through local partners. So it, it meets families where they're at. So tell me how it kind of how the process sort of works. So a, a teacher might notice a student that, you know, needs help or notices that there's some concern. How does the whole process work? Yeah, well, at Helms, they have a Google form that a teacher or other school staffer will will fill out. And that's whether, you know, a student asks for help or if they notice that maybe a student might need help. Uh, So they'll fill out the Google form uh, and then they call that a referral. And then the community schools director will read that and then see what what services they can provide that student or who they can put them in touch with. And this year at Helms, they had 192 referrals, which they said is pretty high. Uh, And they chalked that up a lot to the pandemic and students maybe needing some mental health support. 
you know, coming out of this tough time. Jessica Petrilli is the principal at Helms Middle School. Allie interviewed her outside the school, and you can hear the generator from the mobile dental clinic in the background. She says the idea of a full-service community school is to support the whole child. We get a brand new student, and the student clearly needs a bus pass or like clearly needs some basic needs met before they even start class. Like we have a whole, oh, you're going to see Joyce, and then Joyce can see if he needs also a backpack. And she has backpacks in her room from donations. And, oh, you know, do you need a hygiene kit? Do you need this? And then, and then it's like, oh, that taps her to be like, oh, I'll have the social worker check with them too and just see how he's doing mentally. But a community school also supports parents. And they say, you know, would you like to work with our social worker as a parent? Because it sounds like you're kind of going through a lot too. And usually they're like, please, you know, if you have a lot of children and you're a single parent and you're doing the best you can and you're getting these calls from school every day that your kid is acting out and it can be really overwhelming and you can feel really isolating. And we're trying to say, hey, we're here with you, like we're partners. Jessica says 100% of students at her school qualify for free and reduced price lunch. They also have a lot of newcomers, students who recently arrived from another country. Students are just dealing with a lot in their lives. Some are coming every day and and getting through and some you can see them falling apart right in front of you. And it's like a community school is the dream because then it's like not just on the teacher to figure out everything, you know, because teachers do their best in any school to be all the things. But this just gives them added support and guidance, you know, because at a school like ours, it, it could be a lot more of your students than maybe another school. Leslie Hu from MLK Middle School in San Francisco says listening to students and families about their needs is crucial. She's seen it in other schools, too, like Buena Vista Horace Mann, a K-8 through school in San Francisco's Mission District. They did a lot of talking to their families and partnering with them about like, what are the issues that are really um, impacting them? Because we know that when families are really struggling with X, Y, Z, it really impacts a child's learning. And so that's also part of the community school strategy, is this whole child approach. One of the things they found at that school was a lot of their families were experiencing transitions and housing insecurities. And so they they found that that was a really big issue that was impacting the, the child's ability to be in class and to learn and grow. And they were able to create, it's called the stay over program in their gym, where families and their children can stay there. We think that it's probably one of the, the first and only shelters that are for unhoused families happening in the country, right? And that was really intentional. They were they were able to um, listen to families, like look at that, and then be able to have hundreds of people benefit from this service. There is a lot of support for funding community schools in California. But some do worry that schools need more oversight to make sure they're actually spending the money on new efforts to provide new services and not, say, law enforcement. A coalition of nonprofit organizations, the California Partnership for the Future of Learning, wants the state to prohibit using community school funding to staff police and safety officers. They're also calling for lawmakers to require districts and charter schools that get these community schools grants to report and publicly present to parents and to the rest of the community every year on their progress. And they want an annual evaluation, backed by data, on whether the practices are actually working. Ali, what does the research actually say about how community schools help, what the outcomes are? What does the research say about how, you know, how they're helpful? I think one of the main things that I've seen, um, and this was in a 2017 report from the Learning Policy Institute, uh, is that community schools can lead to increased trust between parents, staff, and students. And that increased trust has led to reduced absenteeism, improved academic outcomes, and a generally more positive school climate. And that's according to the students. Leslie Hu says Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School saw a huge decrease in suspension since they became a community school. And better scores on academic tests, too. We actually have seen like actual data that has indicated to us that that young people are thriving and growing in ways that we have not seen um, before becoming a community school. And so that's been really um, amazing. And it's just like, and, and another thing is like, our teacher turnover rate has completely changed. I mean, this year's different again, but when I got here, there was like a 30% turnover rate with teachers. That is nuts considering we only have about 45 staff members right 
but we had a 30% increase to 4% turnover rate. The challenge of this model is that it costs money. And Leslie says it's great to have more stability with the new community schools grant. She says the school has new plans for next year. She recently met with an organization that provides mental health services, but not so that they would just offer therapy. We actually believe that well-being and connection and healing can happen in the classroom. That's actually the very crux of trauma-informed practices in school, right? Like to have it be healing-centered practices. And so like, how do we actually be intentional? And, And we've been doing a lot of planning for next year to be intentional about how do you have that healing also be happening at in the classroom level and have teachers learn how to do that and partner with each other and learn from experts in addition to being able to to do this work for young people outside of that, right? Because we do think not every kid needs to be in therapy, but every kid can have healing in their classrooms in order to thrive and grow. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Education Beat, Getting to the Heart of California Schools, a production of EdSource. You can find our stories about community schools at edsource.org. Our producer is Kobe McDonald. Special thanks to our guests, Leslie Hu and Ali Tadion, and to Jessica Petrilli. Also a big thanks to John Fensterwald and our director, Ann Vasquez. Our theme music is from Blue Dot Sessions. This episode was brought to you by the Chamberlain Education Foundation. I'm Zadie Stavely. Join me next week and subscribe so you won't miss an episode. <laughs>